If you have your Bibles, if you would open them up to John's Gospel, we're going to start in John chapter 13, and as we do, um, we are continuing through the week of uh, that last week of Jesus' ministry on earth, and uh, the week is called a week of focus, looking at this idea of Jesus in that last week, what does he point out, what does he make Um, the big deal for his disciples, for those in Jerusalem, for those watching on? What are the major things that Jesus, in those final days, that he's taking advantage of those final moments to say? And we have had a difficult Monday and Tuesday. Uh, Monday, we talked about a cursed fig tree. And the idea basically was that here is this Jesus looking at this fig tree And he's saying it has no fruit, though it's been taken care of, though it's been tenderly uh, taken care of, just like I have taken care of you, there is no spiritual fruit in you, no faithfulness in you. Tuesday, we looked at the religious side of things. And I kind of took that, those passages, those woe passages to the Pharisees and kind of used those to really speak to all of us that because Really, at the end of the day, all of us have some type of religion that we're applying to our lives, some way that we decide to live our lives. And whether we are working to please some God or whether we're saying, well, depending on how I do, God will just have to be satisfied with how good I have done. The reality was that when we looked at that, man can't fix his problems. Even if he was given the law and the commandments, you have this God who is Uh, looking at man, and man continuously misapplies and gets them wrong. So who he is is flawed, and he cannot fix it. That was Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday was kind of quiet. Wednesday was the day that uh, someone snuck off to broker a deal for trading in their leader. Judas went and made a deal There was behind-the-scenes plotting done. And then we get to Thursday. Thursday, the eve upon which Christ would die the next day. What I would like to do is spend some time in the book of John. We're going to actually be in three different passages, and we're just going to read the first one together. And then we'll kind of get to the next one, and I'll read that one, and then we'll read the last one a little later in the service. But I want to, to look at the love side of this. Monday and Tuesday have been some really difficult messages. And yet Thursday, we see in Christ the love of God just poured out. And I want to take time just to let let this Jesus in those final moments speak and speak to his disciples and to us today. And so if you have your place, if you would stand, I'm just going to read the first 11 verses of John chapter 13. And then we'll dive in further through several chapters that follow it. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil having Already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and he was coming forth from the Father and going back to the Father, got up from supper and laid aside his garments. Taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into a basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash your feet, or if I do not wash you, you will have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are 
clean. Will you pray with me? Father, I ask that as we meet during this time that you would speak to us. Lord, I thank you for the chance that we have had to sing and to worship, to already be spurred on in our worship and our acknowledgement of who you are as our great God. And now I ask that you would remind us, even as we have spent the last couple of weeks looking at our frailty and our failures, that you would remind us of your love. Lord, I know that it is very easy for us, and maybe some in this room today struggle with their failures and shortcomings. God, I pray that these words on these pages and the time that we spend would be time that you administer through your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. What I want to do is I want to spend some time looking at some reminders of God's love. And so I'm going to be in this passage, and then we're going to dive in later into chapter 14 and then into 16. As we do so, the first thing I want to point out from this passage is this. Jesus came to show the personalness of God. Reminders of God's love. He came to show the personalness of God. You have this moment where he comes and he eats and he serves his disciples. In verse 1, it says, knowing that his departure was near. Verse 2 and 3, knowing his identity and his authority. Yet in this final moment, he lays aside all of his rank and all of his preeminence to be with and to shepherd and to serve his disciples. In his final time together, he shares a meal. He chooses to eat with them. Probably, I, I, I don't know what this moment was like, but it was probably a very tender, sweet moment. Before all the chaos would ensue, Jesus eats a meal with his disciples just hours before the guards would come to meet him in the garden, before the religious leaders and the Roman officials would put him on trial, before going to the cross, beaten and whipped to an unrecognizable form, there was stillness. There was eating, there was visiting, there was communing, there was probably laughter, there was relationship. There was that personal time with Jesus. He spends these final moments gathered around a table for a meal, teaching them some last-minute lessons, speaking to them the words of a new covenant, of His body and the blood, using the bread and the wine. You could easily say that this idea that He knows that all things are given over to Him, that He could have exerted a pride, pointing out all their shortcomings and their need to bow down and to worship Him. He could have used the idea that He knew He was from the Father and He was referring, returning to the Father. And He could have cast all of them aside, just washed their hands of them because of their failures and shortcomings, and instead He washes their feet. William Barclay has this quote. It says, it was just at the time when God was nearest to him that Jesus went to the depths and limits of his service to men. The disciples of the rabbis were supposed to render their master's personal service, but a service like this would never have been dreamt of. The wonderful thing about Jesus was that as his nearness to God increased, so far from separating him from men, it rather brought him nearer to them than ever. Even knowing their betrayal was upon him, he could have turned to hate, but he continued to love them and love them to the end, knowing that a denial would happen, yet he could have turned to frustration and instead he meets with them and stays with them to the end. Intimacy, personal care and concern, serving them even as he was their king, Jesus takes time to relate to them, to share life with them. I hope that's an encouragement for us today, for all of our shortcomings. God pursues us despite our sins so that we might be known by him and in relationship with him. Jesus wants to be with you. That was what he was saying to his disciples that last day. I'm going to spend time with you in the midst of everything that's about to go on. I'm going to sit with you. In a reminder of his love, he came to reveal the personalness of God to them 
to us, to you. So I thought about this morning's life group lesson, and how Jesus is a better everything. Here was this Jesus coming and being with his people. It was a picture of the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He would tabernacle with them. He would be with them. It is very challenging for us sometimes to think of God not as this far off God, but in Christ we see a personality lived out in an expression where there is laughing, there is joking, there is compassion to the highest and the lowest. There is unbelievable grace that is extended. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of a very personal God, who in his final moments spends them with his followers. Look at chapter 14. I want to read the first seven verses. Chapter 14, he goes on to say this, So do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known the, my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Second thing I want you to see in this last time together is that Jesus came to show a path to God. Here's the amazing part of this. The communing that would be had at this meal was not to end, even if death were to come. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to receive you to myself. It would not just be a meal together, but a dwelling together in the Father's house for all of eternity. Communion was to be full and complete. This was not just a, a one-time visitation. This is an introduction to eternity. The question is how? And Jesus shows us both that promise that it will endure and its path. Let me tell you, paths are not always easy to find. And when we find them, they're not always easy to navigate. Just ask Ohio State. I just had to put a plug in there somewhere. It's been a miserable last couple days. No Kentucky basketball. So at least the Buckeyes get upset in the first round. Paths are not easy. And I, I got Wednesday night to sit with some youth boys who are contemplating their futures, trying to figure out colleges and what they're doing. And my son Wednesday night finally chose to go to the University of Kentucky. So I'm very excited about that. Um, but he, I, I was hoping that he was going to put out like two hats, you know, like the Moorhead State hat and the UK hat. And like have like his family sit down in front and him like to give a speech and then to pick the hat that he was going to put on and then click the button and I wake up Thursday morning and he just says, yeah, I accepted that scholarship last night. You did what? Does that mean you're like going? You're like, yep, that's where I'm going. Okay. But it was long in coming. There's other paths, paths to financial freedom, paths to making wise choices. This past week, I decided to be the object of a deer's affection. So on Sunday afternoon, I was driving. A deer leapt to meet me. My question now is, do I try to put that car back together? Or do I go out and find a different car? If anybody has a Toyota Corolla, I love them. Let me know if you need to get rid of one. But I have someone assessing it right now, whether she can live again. If you remember a couple years ago, she, her heart died, and she got a new engine. I've been keeping this thing on, like, life support for, it should have been a hint. As I'm building a, a barn, I've got 12 holes in my yard now, just figuring out where the 
holes go to build this barn is a journey and a process in and of itself. I was on the phone yesterday morning with someone in my life group trying to figure out where am I allowed to put my holes. I submitted one thing to the permanent people, but I really didn't like it when I got out there, so I'm changing it. I just really hope they like me tomorrow morning. You can pray for that. Paths are not necessarily easy. We think we got it figured out. We go, eh, Maybe it's going to be this way or that way. And here we get to this moment where Jesus is talking in this wonderful way and, and Thomas is the guy just says, help me. I don't even know where you're going, much less the way. Like I've been trying to look like I'm that student, you know, that, that's doing okay in the class. For the last three years, Jesus, been listening. I mean, I had my moment. Let's go to Jerusalem and die with you. Hey, I, I had my moment. But let's just get down to it. I have no clue what you're saying to me right now. This is when the teacher is very grateful that the student opens their mouth because that face that looks like this in the math class, I just pray that it's someone's home during that moment. When they open up and they go, now what page are we on? That's when I know. I lost them a long time ago. And here's Thomas. And he opens his mouth. And I can relate to Thomas in a lot of ways. With all the challenges to find the right paths and the often hesitancy we have in knowing it, he asks, where are you going? And Jesus has already said something that allows for what he will say to have power. He says, I go ahead of you. I go to prepare a place and I will come again and receive you. John 3.13, John has already mentioned to the one who no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of God. It's really good that we know the one who knows where things are going and how to get from point A to point B because he's been there, done that. This is our Savior. And so because Thomas asks the question, we get the beautiful answer of Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it's a reminder for us to ask. Because we have a personal God that He takes on these questions. Jesus has come to provide for us a way. A way through life, a way to God. Thomas's asks actually place Jesus right at the center as the very path. Jesus came to show us the path of God and it was Himself. And ironically, so then these first two things are actually very much related. His personalness and the path. Relationship becomes to the path and the end. This is what John um, records Jesus saying in John chapter 17 when Jesus says eternal life is to know the Father. To know the Son that He has sent. It is not just to know God as God Almighty, Judge and Ruler, but to know Him as loving Father. To know Jesus as Savior and friend, not just the second person of the Trinity. And to know the Holy Spirit as His tabernacle ever within us and with us. What is the path to God? Jesus answers, it is I. And what awaits us at the end? It is Jesus. So what are the journeys that you're on in your life right now? As you look at this, have you, have you ever been lost? You ever had that moment of terror come over you when you realize, oh, this is a one-way street the other direction? Or just sat and thought, I have no idea how to get out of this problem right now. Jesus has come to speak into that fear and confusion. As a demonstration of his love, he has revealed the path to God, which is himself. It is our invitation to acknowledge him and receive him today. Jesus was about to go away. And he looked at his disciples and said, I want to be with you. I want to be known by you. And so I will go 
and I am the way that you will one day be with me. All right, now let's look over at John chapter, uh, start in 14, 16. Continue on to just a little bit, a little bit further down the page. It says, Jesus says this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Then skip over to uh, chapter 16, verse 5. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, because, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. The third thing I want you to see that Jesus does for them on this last night is Jesus has come to show the provision of God. In true Baptist form, I have done an alliteration, the personalness, the pathway, and now the provision. The woes of Tuesday. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Could have been left as a mockery of our failed attempts on our own. But instead, the gift of the coming Spirit was to be exactly what remedied the inability. We would not do it, Jesus said. God, through me, would do it, and by His Spirit, you would see it done in you. This is one thing to know the path. It's a whole different thing to walk the path. But any path that leads to God throughout all of mankind has been rendered impossible We're never truly pursued. And so we have this moment where we are called to God and Jesus says, I will provide the means. Jesus calls his disciples to obedience, but with that calling, there's a way to do just that through the Spirit, through the Helper. The Greek word is parakletos. One commentary describes it, that word, that we don't have one word for that. It is someone who is called in. It does many different roles. It may be a person who's called in to give witness to someone's favor. Someone who is called in maybe to plead a cause for someone under charge. He might be an expert called in to give advice in some difficult situation. He may be a person called in to put courage into the hearts and minds of depressed and discouraged soldiers. Jesus says that, You cannot do it, but I shall provide a way in sending the Holy Spirit to you. You can imagine having been a disciple for three years. You've been following this guy. Kind of become dependent upon this guy. You've seen him curse and uh, condemn all the other attempts that have been failures. You've looked and you know your Old Testament. You've read the stories. Man, I just read through Judges. I don't like Judges. It ends awful. And my name is Benjamin. You need to read the end of the Judges. No, you don't. It's just bad. It's awful. And I mean, I I got to the last page of Judges and I was like, I'm serious. I'm just really glad that Ruth is the next book. I'm like, oh. And she was a Moabite, you know. That's the whole point. She was, she was not even of them. Let me be, let, look for an example. Yeah, I've got to go outside my own people. Here are the disciples. They, they've seen all of that. They know all of that. They know all the stories. They know all the failures. Can you imagine? Jesus says, and so I'm leaving. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I live? You've been my identity for the last three years. Where are you gone? I've gone. What you've said, I believed. 
And Jesus says, I'm going to depart. But so that you might do this, I will send the helper. And it's to your advantage, he says, that I depart. Because when you receive the helper, each one of you will have the helper who dwells not just next to you walking along, but in you and goes with you everywhere you go. The helper would be with you and in you forever is what Jesus just told them. Jesus comes to offer the very presence of God with us. His provision, the Holy Spirit, a continual abiding presence in us to do that which man failed to do over and over again, God would be able to do through us. He gives three roles for the Holy Spirit. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Concerning sin, what what points out sin as sin? It's the Holy Spirit. That's what He does. Those who crucified Jesus did not even realize they were in sin. And we walk this planet acting in ways that we don't see as sin, but the Spirit transforms our eyes to see the depths of our rebellion and our rejection. This is what the Holy Spirit promises to do. And I pray that He does that in each of us still. We are here, and to be honest, every one of us have not yet seen ourselves fully in the light of God, His sovereignty, His holiness, and His righteousness. And that's what the Spirit does. Is he walks with us and exposes sin. And for some, it's a call to salvation because He finally opens your eyes to show you that you're doing it your own way and that your own way is rebellion. And so doing, you have rejected Him. And for those of us who have the Spirit dwelling in us, He is continuing to work in us because He promises to bring us to completion and He promises to conform us to the image of Christ who is the radiance of His glory, exact representation of His nature and being. So there's a work that the Holy Spirit is doing The Holy Spirit is the one who brings to light our alternate paths, our failed religiosity, our lack of spiritual fruit of Monday and Tuesday. But it's more than this, because these are symptoms of the root issue. One commentary wrote these words, and I really appreciate it. It said, the world's deepest misery and lostness do not consist in its moral imperfections, but in its estrangement from God and its refusal to allow itself to be called out of that condition. Man's problem is that we are relationally separated from God. Sin is the outward expression of that separation. This is why John, for John, faith is presented as the requirement for salvation. Because faith is believing in God and having a relationship with God. It's not an act. It's the trust in the relationship. Concerning righteousness. This can be taken two ways, maybe. Our righteousness and Christ's righteousness. Isaiah 64, you know this verse. For all of us have become like one who's unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. All of us wither like a a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. And so in one real sense, that's what the Spirit does. He He calls our righteousness for what it really is, filthy rags. But simultaneously, you've just seen the life of Christ laid out before you, which is the righteousness of God. And so the Spirit is condemning one's righteousness and promoting the others. It's what He does. So that we might be those people who trust in Christ and have Him who knew no sin be sent on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And so the Spirit is always pushing those two further and further apart. We might see the distinction between the two. And so thus he not only reveals sin, but our failures to fix it, all the while providing us Christ and our hope of his righteousness applied to us. And then ultimately concerning judgment. It is the helper who brings this to bear upon us, not as some abstract of ideas, 
but as a reality to be, to be faced. Judgment is the sobering reminder that we stand before God condemned if nothing were done about it beforehand. The Holy Spirit thus has come to man so that he might be brought to an awareness and need to act. That today is the day of salvation. That tomorrow may not come. That judgment awaits us if that righteousness is not applied to us. Christ promises to send the Holy Spirit to continue to extend the call of God, to point us to Christ, who is the path so that the personalness of God may be experienced by all. This, a picture of Jesus' love. These are three of the accounts in many chapters in the book of John where you see many displays, whether it's the garden and his willingness to love them, even as he faces the ramifications of the cross, or whether it is him in talking about the high priestly prayer and getting a glimpse of the prayer that Jesus prays, not just for those disciples, but for you and me included in that. That last night, Jesus spent with his people. That last night, Jesus showed us God's love and his desire for relationship. This morning, as I think about that, I want to challenge all of us to consider what does it mean that God's love has been poured out for you? What does it mean that God so desires to be in relationship with you that he demonstrates that in the sending of his son who would sit and eat, who would reach out to those who are on the outskirts? What that means in this room is that there is no one outside of the touch of his love Every person in this room, by the fact that you're in this room or listening to this message, is a demonstration of God's abundant love for you and his desire to be in relationship with you. It means that regardless of your shortcomings and your failures and your lack of spiritual fruit, yet God's love is still being expressed and offered to you. We realize that all of this happens. And what is the very last thing that the disciples do in response to this outpouring and showing of love? They're in a garden. They see him be taken and they flee. Do you think Jesus knew they would do it? Yes. He tells them, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. He looks to Peter and says, before this night will be over, you will deny me three times that you know me. And yet in the midst of knowing that, and knowing that one among them was unclean that would betray him, yet he sits down to the meal and loves them. Yet he sits down and washes their feet. Yet he sits and prays for them, even as he contemplates his own death. Truly it was that he loved them to the end. This is the same Jesus who continues to love today. Monday and Tuesday, really hard days. Messages that needed to be heard. Thursday. A reminder that these things are so hideous and heinous because they are outside of relationship and the personalness of God that he desires for us. What makes Monday and Tuesday so bad is because of how great Thursday's love is demonstrated. That's the offer for you. Is Jesus Christ. The one who has shown us God's love. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Love has a name, and his name was Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, I am, as I think about myself, as I think about the struggles, as I think about the things that go through my head that I allow to sit way too long, the actions that I've taken, the words that I've said, the responses that I've given, Lord, I sometimes so quickly can I identify with Monday and Tuesday. And I can see you as this God who is bringing wrath and condemnation and judgment. And, I, and God, at this point, I, I say I rightly deserve those things. And yet in those final moments, before Christ would face the cross, he just took time to be. He took time to be with his disciples. He took time to be with you. He took time to encourage those who followed him with words of life, and words of hope, words of love. He took time to take on the humility that he would bear on that cross by washing the feet of his disciples. He took time to break bread and to use it as a picture of his body and blood that would be broken for them. He took time to answer questions He did it because you love us. And of all things, it is why you have made us to be in relationship with you. And so this morning, I just pray for everyone in here that they'd be reminded of what Easter is all about. That it is about your love displayed. It is about you coming and being with us so that we might be with you. God, I thank you for your love. I thank you that it does not, that the, the failures of mankind does not stop you from loving. But it makes your love that much more grand as we consider it. That you demonstrated your love that we, while we were still sinners. You would send your son. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus Christ that in him we might see your heart on display. God, help us to receive that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.